Okay, we're going to start with using Kali Linux. So this is going to be an introduction to using Linux. If you have previous experience with Linux, feel free to skip this section and move on. We've got programming next, and again, you can skip that if you're familiar with it already. But if you are new to Linux, which many people are when they're starting out, or you need a refresher, um, definitely take a look at this pretty long video. About an hour long, it just goes straight through, whereas a lot of the other ones are split up. But just some basics, certainly not everything, but from where to start. And of course, as with all of them, everything is covered in the accompanying slides, which you can download. So we're going to start with just a little bit of Linux. I find that a lot of people who start out, including me, when I started pen testing, don't have a lot of Linux experience. I had maybe used it twice, honestly, and a lot of the course material that I was looking at just assumed that I already knew Linux. So I do want to start with just a little bit of Linux. You can follow this course just with this much Linux, but I would encourage you if you're going to continue with pen testing, whatever works for you, a class, a book, just using it in your everyday life, to get familiar with Linux, because a lot of the tools for pen testing are Linux only. I mean, there are some that do have a Windows version. There's even some that are Windows only, but primarily a lot of your developers for your, particularly your open source tools, that is going to be Linux based. So it's certainly worth knowing. And I mean, on top of that, you'll probably run into some Linux targets. I mean, people generally use Windows for their workstations, but a lot of your servers, databases, websites, things like that are going to be Linux based, so you'll probably need to know some Linux. In fact, we have a Linux target in our environment here, as well as some Windows ones. So I'm starting out here on my Kali Linux, and again the password for that is tour, so login root, and then password tour, so root backwards, and that's the default which you are of course, welcome to change if you want to. Just remember what it is. And I already have my command line open. Let's get rid of that. So up here at the top, this is our terminal. So we can just open that up here. And you can, if you want to, make it bigger so you can view, zoom in. Which, of course, you don't have to, but it makes it nicer on the screen, right? Mm, that might be a bit much. How about that? And... You can also like, change the colors and opacity and things, so you could get rid of the dragon, which I generally do for screenshots in my report, so it doesn't have like part dragon in there, which kind of looks a little silly out of context. So that's our Linux command line. So we can do anything on this system straight from the command line, and it's, at least in my opinion, a good deal easier to use than the Windows command line. I mean, PowerShell in Windows is pretty nice, and We'll look at PowerShell briefly later in the class, but on our older Windows systems, we don't have PowerShell, so we're stuck with a certain amount of unhappiness if we end up with command line access to a Windows system, unless we're really good with the Windows command line. I think the Linux command line is much easier to deal with, so we can put in our commands. Um, for instance, we could do like PWD. So. That's just a command. It's short for print working directory. Our default directory, since we are the user root, is slash root. And we can find out more information about a command with something called the man pages. So man short for manual. So man pwd would have more information. Print the name of the current working directory. There's also some additional options. Um, another one would be like man ls list directory contents list information about the files. It also has some options like dash a will do not ignore entries starting with a dot, so it won't ignore hidden directories. Lots of other ones here. Let's see. Grab one more. Dash little l, use a long listing format, so a different format for the output. So say I want to do, say ls, let's just start with the root. So that's going to be the root of the file system, that slash. And see our working directory here with slash root, so that's in roots directory. But let's do an ls on the root. 
So there's all our directories in the root. So you can kind of think of the Linux file system as a tree. So we've got root slash at the top, and then it's got all these branches, and some of these are directories, like here's our root directory. We've got some other ones as well. User, var, sys, temp, mount, opt, media, lib, home, lots of stuff. Um, so we could also do ls-a. That'll show us. It doesn't look like we have many hidden directories here. We just have the dot, which is the current directory, and the dot dot, which is the parent. And we can also do dash L for the long format. So this shows us additional information. So what does all this mean, I wonder? Um, so what we have here is this is actually the file permissions on each of these files. So we have read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, write, execute. There are three different groups. We'll get to that in just a second. And then we have, I think that's how many links there are to it. And then the owner, the group, the size, and last modified date, and then the name. So a little bit more information there. And we can navigate around the file system. Like again, we are still at slash root. If I wanted to go to say root, I could do cd slash change directory cd. Again, we can do man cd. Oh, there is no man entry for cd. So that one we might have to check out the internet for more information. We can always Google as well. Man pages can be a little bit unattractive to read. So. Sometimes the internet is easier yeah, either way. And so we can also do, I'll just go back to slash root. We can also do, like if I wanted to do cd dot dot, remember that dot dot is the parent. So that will be the equivalent of cd root because we're in slash root. So that will take me to the parent, which is going to be root go to slash. Yay. So let's see, let's go back to root again. We can also do cd onto root's desktop. And I could do like cd dot 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 dot. So that'll take me two parents up. So that'll take me back to root and go into a different directory. So like Etsy, and then my one on root here. So here's Etsy. So if I want to go to the Etsy directory, I can do that. So now I'm in Etsy. So we can move around again and you can kind of think of it as a tree. You don't have to be familiar with like where everything is and what all of the directories mean. Really you can just know that you're in your root directory or slash root, your home directory for root by default and the slash is the beginning of the file system. Like mount is where we mount drives, temp is temporary files. There's lots of different things in there. So, user privileges, how about that? So again, we are user root. So our home directory is slash root. There's also slash home we saw. Home actually doesn't have anything in it right now. Kali Linux is an interesting Linux system in that it only has the root user, which is fairly uncommon for Linux. The best practice for using Linux is to do all every day today tasks um, as an unprivileged user and only use root, which is equivalent of system on Windows. So you're almighty, completely controlling the file system user for activities that require root privileges. So that way we wouldn't Hopefully we wouldn't manage to destroy anything. If we're root all the time and then say I used a command called rm. Um, so if I went into root and I said rm-rf and I let that run, what would happen is that I would actually delete my entire file system. So it's actually kind of a joke that you see on 
hacking boards all the time and it's like teach me how to hack tell people to go into their Linux system and do a rm rs so that's going to tell it to force recursively remove files so it's going to actually remove the entire file system in that case because it's from the root directory and since we're root that that would be perfectly legal there would be nothing to stop that we have that privilege whereas if i was just a normal user i wouldn't be able to just delete the file system i'd only be able to access files that i have permissions to work with so that's a pretty good example of why we shouldn't use root all the time Kali's a little bit different it's not for one, an everyday use operating system. It's specifically built for pen testing. And most pen test tools actually are going to require root privileges. They set up network sockets and listen on the network and crack passwords and all sorts of other things. So I mean, not everything is going to require root privileges, but a fair amount of them do. So I guess it just makes it easier. You know, I didn't write Kali, but that's as far as I can remember always been the case is that it's always been a root user. Of course we can add another user if we want to and it may not be necessary for Kali but if you are working with other Linux systems you'll probably have some other user that is not root. You could do add user and I'll just do Georgia under a password for Georgia. I always use password for these examples. That's a really terrible password. I realized that you should never use the same passwords that I use in production. So Use a better password than password, but remember what it is, of course. Then you can fill in these values. I always just leave them blank. Is this information correct? Yes. So now we have a user called Georgia, whose password is password in my case. So what we can do is I could change users to that user Georgia. So I'm going to do a sue Georgia. That made me the user Georgia. You can see my prompt has changed here. Now I'm Georgia at Cali. So now if I wanted to do an add user, say James. So the add user command doesn't exist, but we know it does. We just used it. Well, Georgia doesn't have root privileges. Georgia has limited user privileges. So Georgia actually doesn't have the ability to add users to the file system. Nor should she as just a regular user. So what we would need to do in this case is actually use something called sudo or sudo. Let me exit and go back to root. So I did exit and that took me back to my root prompt. And what I want to do is add Georgia to the sudoer group. So groups are just groups of users. The a user can be in multiple groups. And one such group is the sudoers, and that is people who are allowed to basically pretend to be root. These users can basically request root privileges on a temporary basis so they can perform commands such as add user. So what I want to do as root is do add user again, and then Georgia, and then I want to add Georgia into sudo. That added Georgia into the pseudo group. So now if I drop back down to Georgia, and instead of doing add user James, where it says command not found, I do pseudo add user James. It you know gives me a little warning about using pseudo. It does in fact give us root privileges. We can do bad things with it. We should not. Then it prompts me for my password. I don't have to have the root password for this. I need to have George's password, which is, in my case, password. So then that allows us to use the add user command. So we could add this user James to the file system. So then after we've done sudo, we lose our root privileges immediately. So it's only for that one command that we keep those root privileges. So now we're back to being a normal user. So hopefully we won't be able to destroy the file system now. All right, so let's see, what else? How about files? Well, files are pretty important, right? So let's 
go ahead and exit out of here, go back to being a root. Let's see the home Georgia. They have all sorts of nonsense in the root directory, as do you if you set up this. We added some more stuff to it, so during the setup, so let's just get a clean directory here. Since we created the user Georgia, she's got a directory in the home folder. So let's just CD there so we have a nice, again, clean space to work with. So everything in Linux is going to be a file. Absolutely everything. A device driver is a file. A disk is a file. A user is a file. Everything's a file. So that can be a little bit confusing, but unless you're, I guess, doing Linux system programming, you'll never even notice. So you don't have to worry about it. So let's create a file. More traditionally, we think of files as like binary or hex or text or something we can work with or that the operating system works with. So let's just create a little text file. So one way to do that is the touch command. So I'll just call it my file. Now if I do an ls, there's my file that I just created. You can also create directories. So mkdir, make directory. And I'll just call that my directory. Now if I do an ls, see our directory is blue. So that's going to be directory. And then we have my file. So we, we can also, of course, cd into my directory. It's blank right now. And we can, of course, move files around as well. We can copy them, which will keep the original file in place. And we can also move them, which will delete the original and put it in the new place. So for instance, if we wanted to take my file from home Georgia and put it in home Georgia, my directory, we could, with the cp command, copy it. Again, that'll keep the original file and make a copy here in my directory. So remember it's in the parent. So we could do dot dot slash to move back to home Georgia and grab my file. And we could do a dot to place it here. We can also, we don't have to use those dot dots if we don't want to. If that's a little bit confusing for you, you can always just do the full path. If I want to copy home Georgia my file, I can do that. So I can Give it the absolute path is what that's called instead of the relative one. So relative to where I am or absolute from the root. Either way it will work. Whichever is more comfortable for you. I'm going to flip back and forth, honestly. And then again, the dot could be here. So we could make that absolute as well. We could do home, Georgia, my directory. And we can tab complete, which is nice if you're about as good a speller as I am. So home, Georgia my directory, my file. So either way it'll work. So that brought my file here. But since we use cp for copy, that did keep the original my file in place. So we can also do mv for move. So that will again delete the original one and move it to the new file name. So I'm going to move my file to my file too. So basically that just renamed it since we moved from one file name in the directory to another one. So all we really did there was rename it. Of course we could, as we did with the CP, move it to a different directory. We can also remove files. So we saw that rm-rf to delete the entire file system. We can do that with a single file. So I can do an rm my file too and that file's gone. Possibly we could get it back with some digital forensics, so maybe you'll want to take a forensics course, but there was nothing in it anyway, so not that exciting. But finding people's deleted pictures and such is a fun thing for forensic analysts to do. So, of course, maybe we do want to actually put some text into a file. So let's start with the echo command. So if we do echo and say hi Georgia, that prints out hi Georgia onto the screen. So let's do echo hi Georgia and then use a greater than sign to put that into a file. 
So I'll call this one my file again. Remember I deleted my file. Well, I moved it to my file too, and then deleted my file too. So let's just recreate my file. I'm going to echo Hydro Jet into my file. So that time it didn't print anything out to the screen. All of the output went into my file. So we can use a command called cat. Of course, we can always use man pages. Cat is short for concatenate files and print on the standard output. I am using Q to get out of the man pages. I'm not sure if I said that, so that's a, a Q to get out of the man pages. Quit. So I can cat my file. It says, hi, Georgia. But what if I do, if I echo hi, Georgia again into my file? And if I do a cat my file? It says hi, Georgia again, but hi, Georgia isn't there anymore. It overwrote what was previously in that file. The may or may not be what you want. Sometimes we might want to append to a file, so keep what's already there and just add some text at the bottom. Now we can do that. Say hi, Georgia a third time, and this time I want to put double greater than signs. This is going to tell it to append, so it's going to put hi, Georgia a third time at the end of my file. Sure enough, hi Georgia again, and hi Georgia a third time. Of course, we might want to do a little bit better than this. We might want to have some real text editing going on. You can see how this would be a really annoying way to create a file. There are actually a few different text editors for Linux, and honestly, I've never seen people fight quite so much about anything in computer science as which text editor is the best in Linux. I personally prefer Nano. A lot of people laugh at me about that because they like VI better or Vim or you know, heaven forbid Gedit or Emacs, but some people really like VI, some people really like Nano. I like Nano. I actually started in VI, but I like Nano primarily because I do a lot of things like this where I'm making videos and if I screw it up I just lose what 22 minutes worth of video because I haven't cut this into pieces because I'm I guess getting arrogant that I think I can do like a whole module in one shot um, but if I was using VI it's I find very unforgiving and I could end up ruining the video basically um, and you may actually see me do that luckily we're learning VI so it would be appropriate but I think Nano is much more forgiving. So we'll start with Nano. If you're not familiar with any Linux text editor, I would encourage you to use Nano just because it's easier. Um, but if you want to be one of the cool kids, they seem to like VI. So whatever works for you. So if I say Nano and my file, that'll open up my file in Nano, which again is a text editor. So we see the two lines that we have here. With Nano, we can just directly start typing. If I wanted to start at the beginning, I could say, Hi, Georgia. Hi, Georgia again. Hi, Georgia a third time. And I made it caps for whatever reason. I can use my arrow keys to move around. So pretty typical, like how a text editor you would think would work. How about green gumdrops? I don't know why I always say green gumdrops. And I have to, like make lists. I always do colors. I'm not sure why. Um, and then what I can do, you can see there's some specials commands you can do down here at the bottom. Like um, if we do control W for where is, that'll search. Obviously in something this small, don't really need to search for anything, but in a longer file we might. So I could search for blue. It found blue. And it highlighted that line. And if I put in like purple, purple not found. So we can search our files. We've got really long configuration files for programs or devices. The search can be rather nice. Um, to get out of it, it says control X, exit here, and save modified buffer. Answering no will destroy changes. So if we say no, it will delete all our changes. If we say yes, it will save the file to say no, so an N instead of a Y. So we can do the same thing with VI, another editor. 
for vi my file. So again, it opens up, and since I didn't save the changes, I have Hi Georgia again and Hi Georgia a third time. VI is going to be a little bit different. If I just start trying to type Hi Georgia, well, I didn't get an H, and then when I typed the I, something interesting happened. I got insert mode here. Oddly enough, in order to insert text into a file with VI, you have to be in insert mode instead of command mode, which is the default, and hitting the I key is what puts you in insert mode. So, now that I'm in insert mode, I can say, hi Georgia, two and a half times, and then I can get out of this to go back to command mode. I mean, as long as I'm in insert mode, I can type just normally. I can hit escape and you see that insert goes away and then you know if I keep typing oops I just got rid of something what did I just do a whole line just went away what command did I hit well I actually hit DD so I hit D key twice so that's I guess delete the whole line DD it's also just dump whatever so DD will delete the entire line so DD again that'll get rid of the highlighted line of course, I can't just start typing again, but I can do the I again to go back into insert mode. And I could say hi, Georgia, another time. Escape to get out. And there's certainly other commands besides DD to delete a whole line. I like DD because I often have lines I need to delete of shell code that we'll see when we do exploit development. So. You know, it's not so bad if you just remember what that you need to be in insert mode and escape and don't end up hitting any strange commands by accident when you're not in insert mode. For instance, you know, I hit two Ds and that goes away. And then, you know, that could be rather hard to recover from. Also, to save things in VI, it's a little bit different. What we actually do is shift and then colon. And we see we get the colon down here at the bottom. And we need to do this in command mode. Then we want to say W for write and then Q. So it's going to write. So it is going to save the file. And then it's going to quit. So hit enter. And that did save our changes this time. So again, I mean, whatever you think is best. There are other ones as well. I mean, there's even some graphical ones. But either knowing Nano or VI if not both, is certainly worthwhile. You may find yourself with only command line access on a Linux system, on a pen test. You might need to edit something, and being able to do it all from the command line is certainly worth knowing. You know, they both work. They're both commonly seen on systems, so you should be fine as long as you know one, but whichever one works for you. So let's see, what else? What about those file permissions? We saw those when we did the ls-l earlier. We saw our file permissions and I mentioned we had read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, write, execute. So three sets of permissions. So read, write, and execute makes sense, right? We can read the file, we can write to the file, we can execute the file. Probably executing this text file called my file won't make anything particularly interesting happen, but reading and writing it might be interesting. What if it stored passwords for some program? Having read access to it would be something that would be definitely cool. What if it was, say, um, source code for a web server and we wanted to deface someone's website? Having write access would be very, very interesting. What if it was a password decryptor, so it was used by a program to take a password hash and make sure whether it was right and like throw out a secret key at the end or give you access to like a, a key to open up additional functionality that you should have to pay for. Being able to execute it when you shouldn't would be something we'd want to do. So having extra permissions that you shouldn't on files is a valid way of getting access to a system or more access than you had, and like local privilege escalation. It happens. 
Certainly, people develop programs and give too much permissions. I've been guilty of that, certainly. I've certainly set things to full access for everybody when I shouldn't have, because it's easier than coming up with what should be the right permissions. And I'd certainly rather spend my time actually developing stuff than developing it securely. That's generally the problem with security. You don't get medals for making things secure. You get medals for writing cool stuff. So, a little off topic there, but, so we've got a read, write, execute, and three sets. So the first one, the one on the left, is the owner. The owner is root. The second set is the group. So anyone else who was in the root group besides root would have read and execute permissions on this directory. Whereas root, the user itself, would have read, write, and execute permissions. And then the third set is everybody else or the world. So everybody can read and execute. So on my file, it looks like we have read write permissions for root, just read permissions for the group, and just read permissions for the world. So what if we want to change those? We can change permissions on files that we own, or if we're root, we can change permissions on anything. Don't go crazy on changing permissions. I think it was in a Actually, probably one of my first security classes, we were supposed to make a secure system or we were basically doing attack and defend in the class and I had a Linux system and I was like, oh, I'll just like take away the file permissions from like everything so if somebody gets on it, they can't use it. Well, unfortunately, neither could like the programs that are on here that like have to read files, like their configuration files, like the operating system itself suddenly had problems functioning, so probably stick to your own files just to keep from having to wipe this thing out and start over but as root we can change any file permissions that we want so how we do that is with chmod we have a few different ways of using chmod so what we can do is we can use the way I usually do it is like this give it numbers so there is a chart in your slides, so if you look at the slides for this section, I don't have them up right now, but if you look at the slides, there is a table that shows the integer values for chmod, so it goes all the way from 0 to 7. 7 is full permissions, 0 is no permissions, and execute only is 1, write only is 2, write and execute is 3, so you can think of it in terms of binary, and again that's in the slide as well, so it's just a binary representation. And read only is 4, read and execute is 5, read and write is 6, and again, 7 is full. And if you don't remember those, again, it's in the slide, but honestly, I Google it all the time. I mean, 7 and 0 are obviously easy to remember, but some of the ones in the middle, you'll probably forget them. So, no problem there. So what we can do is say, I want, how about I do like 7, 5, 0, so one digit for each so we've got owner, group, and everyone. So owner should have full permissions, so read, write, and execute. What did we say five was? Read and execute. So the group should have read and execute permissions, and the zero is nothing. So everyone should have no permissions. We do our ls-l again. Looks like exactly what happens. So we have read, write, execute read and execute, and nothing. So we can change those and you can use different values. There are other ways of doing it, like we could do like ch mod plus x would add execute permissions for everybody. So now we have execute permissions for everybody. I find the digit way is the easiest, but there are certainly other ways to do it. So, I mean, the main point is if you have sensitive files, we want to make sure that we don't give them too many permissions. That would be bad.